Amen. God does never sleep. And that's fitting because we're going to look at this morning that even in God's church, God never sleeps. He's always working in the church. Always working in the church. Regardless how the church is, he is always working in the church. Our scripture reading there in Psalms 46, if you open up again your Bibles. Psalm 46, verse 1. God is our refuge and strength. A very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Amen. Though the earth be removed... And though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling, there is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place, the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. Who is a her? God is in the midst of his church, friends. Don't ever forget that. God is in the middle, in the midst of his church. She will not be moved. Friends, God's church is going to go all the way through to the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Whether you're in it or not, God's church is going to go through. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you very much. Because you make yourself responsible for the working and the going forward of your church. Continue to bless your church. Take away any dis distractions this morning. And help us to open our hearts to your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. This morning what I want to share with you is how the early church... The early church is very similar to our church. When I refer to the early church, I'm talking to the church in the book of Acts. And we're going to spend all of our day, all of our time, in the book of Acts. So you can turn to Acts chapter 1. We're going to spend the entire message in the book of Acts. And I want to show, with you, show you or share with you that there are, are some similarities between the early church and even our church. On how God has blessed and worked with early church and God is blessing his church today. As we are focusing also on evangelism this year and the role of the church. We're going to see that throughout the early church, God has, Holy Spirit is working and being poured out. There in, in Acts, chapter, Acts chapter 2, we see that the Holy Spirit is poured out so strong after the apostles have come together in one accord in the upper room. The Holy Spirit comes down and gives them the gift of tongues for what? To preach, to share the gospel. And 3,000 and many more are added into the church and the Holy Spirit is poured out as tongues of fire there, the Bible says. And they are able to speak in other languages and share the good news of Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 3, we see there that Peter, Peter and John go to the temple, right? We've heard this story or, or sang the song. And there is a man who cannot walk by the gate, by the temple. And Peter says, silver and gold have I none, but what I do have I will give to thee. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And what does the song say? He went rising and leaping and jumping and praising God, right? So we see, we see the work of the Holy Spirit. We see the work of God. And I want you to keep in mind that God worked through Peter in healing that man. Both through Peter and John. But Peter was the one that said, listen to me what I'm going to tell you right now. I don't have any gold or silver, but what I have I'm going to give to you. It was Peter. And I want you to keep that in mind. We're going to see some of the flaws, even in the early church, in the life of Peter. So here we see that Peter and John do great miracles. 
In Acts chapter 4, Peter and John continue to preach. They get, they get arrested, but then they are released, and yet the church continues to grow and to grow and to grow. In Acts chapter 5, it, it, it continues to grow so much that they are beginning to sell their properties or some properties and distribute the monies as needed in the church. They are, they are literally in one accord, um, in one love, working together. And sometimes we think to ourselves, man, we need to be like that as a church. Our church is lacking the power of the Spirit like the early church. Friends, we in some sense are just like the early church. Because in Acts chapter 5 verse 1, as their church is marching along just great, what's the first word in Acts chapter 5 verse 1? But, okay, everything is going good, but there was a certain man named what? Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. And he kept back part, verse 2, of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to God, but you lied to you, you, you have not lied to man, but you've lied to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the young man arose and wrapped him up, carried him out, and buried him. Are you, are you following along with the story there, right? Peter, Peter tells him, you know, you, couldn't, you didn't have to say that you gave all of it. You could have just given part of it and, and mentioned that and we would have been just as happy. Isn't the money yours to do with whatever you want? And we're going to look more into details on the story of Ananias and Sapphira on April the 2nd, on the first Sabbath of, of April. We're going to really see what the real sin was of Ananias and Sapphira, which we're going to discover that it had nothing to do with money. So I, I really want to encourage you to come on that Sabbath. Come every Sabbath, but especially come on that Sabbath as we discover the real sin of Ananias and Sapphira. But when you come, make sure you, make sure you come wearing a helmet. <laughs> so then, what happens to Ananias here? He drops dead. Now it was, in verse, in verse 7, now it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened, and Peter asked her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. Then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look at the feet of those who have buried your husband are, are at the door and they will carry you out. Then immediately she breathed her last. He fell down and breathed her last. And the young man came in and found her dead and carried her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear, so great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. Here we see the church is going great. But there's a problem. We see bold and open hypocrisy right here. Bold and open hypocrisy in the early church. You see, the hypocrisy is so bad and so bold and so early in the church that God himself gets involved and God himself steps in and deals with the problem. It's not Peter, you know, who disciplined these church members. No, God stepped in and dealt with the issue. And Ananias and Sapphira, they were good members. We cannot say they were bad members. They were willing to give to the church. The, the problem wasn't the giving part. There, there was another issue. But we see open hypocrisy here in the early church. 
And yet, even though there is open hypocrisy, is the Holy Spirit still working in the church? Yeah. The Holy Spirit is still working in the church. How about in, in our church today? Do we see open hypocrisy in the church today? Yeah, we do. And it's so much easier now to even bump into it without even wanting to know about it. With the invention of, of Facebook, <laughs> you see, we see church members on Friday night where they shouldn't be wearing what they shouldn't wear and then coming in on Sabbath and pretending a whole different personality. Friends, open hypocrisy today exists in the church. But does that keep from the Holy Spirit working in the church? Did it keep it in the, in the early church? Yet the Holy Spirit is still working. Yet the Holy Spirit is still working. Look at Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 8, after, after 7 is, is a stoning of Stephen. Acts chapter 8 and 9 is a conversion of Saul. And in Acts chapter 10, we see that there's even discrimination and prejudice going on in the early church. Acts chapter 10, verse 9 here, it says, talking about Peter. The next day, Acts chapter 10, verse 9, the next day as they went on, they journeyed and drew near the city. Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the six hours. Then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven open and an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners descended to him and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed four, four, four animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to Peter. What did it say? Rise, Peter, kill, and eat. But Peter said, No, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again and said, What God has cleansed you must not call common. This was done how many times? Three times the Lord says, Peter, rise, kill, and eat. But Lord, I never touch anything unclean. Peter, rise, kill, and eat. Three times. Three times. Peter has his vision, and as a Jew, Peter is confused. Because Jews do not eat unclean animals. And then in chapter, there, there, in verse 19, Peter is invited to go share the gospel. But he still has the vision in his mind that, 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 that has him puzzled. Acts 10, verse 19, it says, While Peter thought about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men who had been sent to him from Cornelius and said, Yes, I am the man, he whom you seek. For what reason have you come? And they said, Cornelius, the centurion, a just man, one who fears God and has a good reputation among all the nations of the Jews, was divinely instructed by a holy angel to summon you to his house and to hear words from you. Then he invited them in and lodged them. On the next day, Peter went away with them. Some brethren from Joppa accompanied him. So here Peter is thinking about the vision and, he, and God tells him, someone's going to come visit you. Go with them. You know, I, I have sent them. So he goes with them. He goes with them. And you see, Peter's Jewish prejudice would have prevented him from dealing with Gentiles. Jews are not supposed to deal with Gentiles. But he goes. He goes because the Lord says, go with them. So he goes. And in verse 28, Acts 10, there, verse 28. The Bible says, Then he said to me, You know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation. But God has shown me 
that I should not call any man common or what? Or unclean. And then he goes with them and the rest of the chapter he preaches to them the gospel and they accept it. And they accept the gospel. Peter realizes that the vision that God gave him really has nothing to do with eating camel sandwiches or snake soup or anything unclean. No, no, no. What was Peter calling common and unclean? People. Gentile. People that weren't Jews. And God says, rise up and eat. These are my people too. And so here, Peter himself recognizes the light bulb turns on. There, where he says, God has shown me that I shall not call anyone common or unclean. So Peter realizes that and he goes out. And there in verse 44, in the same chapter, verse 44 through 48, it says, while Peter was still speaking, because he preached to them, speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all these who heard the word and those of the circumcision who believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. The Jews are astonished that the Holy Spirit is being poured out on Gentiles. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Did the Holy Spirit pour out the gift of tongues in the Gentiles too? Just like in Acts chapter 2. It goes on to say in verse 48, and Peter goes on to say, what forbids you guys to be baptized? And they get baptized. Praise the Lord. They get baptized. The Holy Spirit is poured out, friends, even among Peter's misunderstanding and Peter's discrimination against the Gentiles or Peter's prejudice against anything else that's not Jew, the Holy Spirit still is being poured out. Peter is slow to understand and accept that the gospel is for everyone. He's slow to understand that. He doesn't get that. And he is slow to catch up with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wants the, everyone to know. But yet God sends, has to send Peter a vision to get him on track to catch up with him. We see this in the church, in the, in the early church, and yet the Holy Spirit was still working. The Holy Spirit was still working even though Peter, remember this was the, the same Peter that, that told that man, rise up and walk. I don't have any money, but what I have I give to you. The Holy Spirit was still working through Peter, and even here as well. Although Peter had other negative thoughts about other people, that they are not to be saved, God corrected that. And the Holy Spirit was still, was still used Peter to grow the church. If a church is slow to do God's work, it doesn't mean that it is not doing God's work. The Holy Spirit is still working. The Holy Spirit is still working. And notice there in Acts chapter 11, okay, Peter goes back to Jerusalem and the word gets out that he went and talked to the Gentiles. In Acts chapter 11, it says, And the apostles and brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision, which are Jews, contended with him, saying, You went into uncircumcised men and ate with them? You know, this is astonishing for them. You went with the Gentiles, those unclean common. But in Peter's mind, I'm sorry. And then he explains the rest of chapter 11. He explains to them, God show me that they're not common or unclean and that they should be given the gospel as well. And at the end, the, there even in verse 18, they finally get it. When they heard these things, they became silent and they glorified God saying, then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance of life. The church is slow, but yet the Holy Spirit is still working in the church, friends. 
The church was slow, but yet the Holy Spirit is still working in the church. Have you ever felt sometime maybe that the church isn't working or isn't going along with what you think the Holy Spirit has its plans for the church? I do. I sometimes feel that the church, we're not moving along as the Holy Spirit wants us to move. That doesn't mean the Holy Spirit is not working. The Holy Spirit continues to work in the church. Look at, notice Acts chapter 15. We still see some more issues with the church that we can relate to today in our church. Acts chapter 15, verse 1. It says, And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Does that sound familiar? Here we have some Jews, some certain men, saying unless you are circumcised, you can't be saved. You can't be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dis dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. Notice verse 2. When Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute. That means that they had a big argument, a big discussion about this issue. And what did they recommend? You got to go, you got to go take it to the general conference, take it to the GC. We can't, we can't figure it out here. But here we have theological conflicts in the early church. In the early church. Friends, I've heard it say, you know, and I will make that correction right now if there's any still misunderstandings. But it is not a sin to eat meat and cheese. Amen. Amen. It is not a sin. Some have taken that stand that it is a sin and you will be kept out of heaven. I apologize if you have heard of that. It is not a sin to eat meat and cheese or milk. Jesus ate cheese and milk with Abraham right before he sent his two angels to, to destroy Sodom and, and, and Gomorrah. So if it's a sin, we have a big problem with Jesus eating it with Abraham. It is not a sin. That does not mean that we have the liberty as well. Because praise the Lord that we do have the testimony of Jesus to give us light in the church today. We do have the testimony of Jesus that tells us that the way the world is in the conditions the world is and the conditions the food is processed, it is recommended to abstain and leave meat and dairy and all that alone. Because it does affect your health. And anything that affects your health affects your mind and the mind is the only way that the Holy Spirit communicates to us. No, because something is not a sin does, does not give us the liberty to do it. On the contrary, the question, shouldn't, the question shouldn't be, is it a salvation issue? That shouldn't be the question. Is it pleasing to God? Am I pleasing God? Should be more. It's not whether it is a salvation issue because we will never find a list of do's and don'ts in the scripture. The early church had theological conflicts, but it is still God's church. And the Spirit was still working. And just how the, the Spirit worked in the early church, the Spirit works in our church today. In our church today. See, some people think that until we are united in certain things, the Holy Spirit won't work. Some people think that until we are united in music, until we are united in the ordination of women, until we are united in diet, then the Holy Spirit cannot work. That is not true. That is not true. We see here the early church are divided in certain issues, and yet the Holy Spirit is still being poured out and working and blessing and growing the church. 
The early church had division, had hypocrisy, had prejudice, and the spirit was still being poured out, friends. Not because they were perfect, but because they put their faith in a perfect God. And they were growing as the church was growing. They were growing as well. Not only did they have theological conflicts, they even had personality conflicts. Look at Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15, we see their personality conflicts. And this is one that at least I see here. Acts chapter 15, verse 1. No, I'm sorry. Verse 36. Acts 15, verse 36. Then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Now Barnabas started with a good idea. Well, determined to take with him with them John called Mark but Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia notice Paul didn't say I don't want to bring John Mark no he says I don't want to bring the one who abandoned us and had not gone with them to the work verse 39 says then the contention between became so sharp that they departed from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the church. Strengthening the church. Notice verse 39. Then the contention became so sharp that they departed from one another. Are you serious? This is just childish argument. Barnabas is saying, John Mark is coming with us. Paul is saying, no, he's not. Yes, he is. Let it come. He abandoned us one time. He's not going to do it again. Don't worry. I will be responsible. He is not coming. And maybe Paul took the liberty, you know, I am Paul the missionary, you are my assistant, he is not coming, end of the sentence. And Barnabas is saying, well then I'm not going with you. Can you picture these godly leaders? Who? Godly leaders arguing like children. Friends, if these walls could talk, if my, church, if my office walls could talk, well, pastor, I'm not going to say I'm sorry until they say it first. Well, pastor, I didn't do anything wrong, so they need to apologize. And I'm in the middle. <laughs> listening to childish discussion. And praise the Lord for the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. While I am praying, he is telling me, don't do what you're thinking. Because the, sometimes there are mature, grown members of the church arguing as children. And my instinct is just, brother, come here. <laughs> Wake up. No. Praise the Lord for the Holy Spirit. But yet, what happens here in the missionary work of Paul and Silas? They go their own ways. They go their own ways. Later on, when you read the book of Acts, all three, Paul, Barnabas, and John Mark, are working together. Paul even asked, bring John Mark with you when he's in prison. Eventually, they kiss and made up. But here you see personal, persona personality conflicts among the godliest of leaders, and yet the Holy Spirit was still working in the church. Praise the Lord. Friends, this should give you hope. If you see your church, man, my, our church has problems here and problems here. We'll never have the hope. Friends, the early church had similar conflicts and problems, and the Holy Spirit was still working in the church. Praise the Lord. Luke describes a church with real problems, real issues, real stubbornness, real pride, real prejudice, 
that were not perfect but put their faith in a perfect Savior. From Acts 16, 17, and 18, Paul is out in mission trips. He's out in mission trips. And then we get to Acts chapter 21. He comes back to Jerusalem. And he's talking about how it's going with the mission trips there in Acts chapter 21. And the church seems to believe now that Paul has just gone too far. The church leaders, the church leaders seem to believe that Paul has gone too far. Notice Acts chapter 21, verse 17. 21, verse 17. Paul is coming back from his missionary trips. And when he had come to Jerusalem, the brethren received, received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. When he had greeted them, he told in detail those things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord. And they said to him, okay, they were happy, and then here comes the problem. You see, brother, how many, you see, brother, how many myriads of Jews there are who have become, who, no, who have believed, and they are all zealous for the law. But they have been informed about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, nor to walk according to the customs. Are you seeing the problem here? You see, the issue with circumcision had already been taken care of. The council in Jerusalem said, that's fine, Gentiles don't have to circumcise. It's, you know, there were, there were four things, abstain from idols, um, I can't remember the rest of the three that they had to, to, to do. And so, and so here, now, Paul is telling even the Jews who are coming to be believers, you guys don't got to circumcise your children either. And the Jewish leaders have an issue with that. The, the, now the Jewish leaders are saying, you know, you've gone too far. It's okay that, that the Gentiles don't do it. But don't take away our customs, as we've always done it, as Moses has instructed us to do. And Paul is doing it, not because it, it, it is, there is nothing theological about circumcision when it comes to salvation. And so Paul, in winning hearts and winning people to Christ, just how he tells the Gentiles, he's telling the Jews as well. And the church leaders have an issue with that. Friends, you know, it's either yes, do it, or no, you don't have to do it, right? It's one or the other. And that's how Paul is thinking. So what is their solution there in verse 22? What then? The assembly must certainly meet, for they will hear that you have come. Therefore, do what we tell you. We have four men who have taken a vow. Take them and be purified with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads and that all may know that those things of which they were informed concerning you are nothing, but that you yourself also walk orderly and keep the law. Are you seeing what they're, they're, they're trying to do? They want to support Paul's work, but they want to keep the Jews happy. And they're saying, go through this process of purification with these other four men. If you need to get purified, it's because what? You're unclean. You're dirty. And so because Paul has spent more, about two or two and a half years out in missionary trips in the mission field with the Gentiles, they felt he needs to be purified. He's been spending too much time with those icky Gentiles. <clears throat> and so here, they say, go through this process. And they wanted to support Paul, but they also wanted to stretch out and support the Jews and not upset them and have the Jews look. You see, 
Paul likes to go into the customs of Moses. So, so, so you don't have to worry. You can just relax and calm down. They were playing the political game. The church leaders were playing the political game right here. And wanting to please Paul and wanting to please the Jews. You know, in Acts of the, Acts of the Apostle, I don't know why it has a different word than playing the political game. But notice what it says. The brethren hoped regarding this, this problem here. And Paul, the brethren hoped that Paul, by following the course suggested, might give a decisive contradiction to the false reports concerning him. They assured him that the decision of the former council concerning the Gentiles, converts, and the ceremonial law still held good. They had no problem with the, the Gentiles not doing it, but they said, don't, get, don't touch the Jews with their tradition. But the advice now given was not consistent with that decision. The Spirit of God did not prompt this instruction. It was a fruit of what? It was a fruit of cowardice. The leaders of the church in Jerusalem knew that by non-conformity to the ceremonial law, Christians would bring upon themselves the hatred of the Jews and expose themselves to persecution. And so to avoid upsetting the Jews and persecution, Paul, just go through this ceremony as Moses, we you know, instructed us to do, and we'll keep them happy. But we still support you, you know, don't worry. You can still continue saying to the, the Gentiles not to get circumcised, but don't tell the Jews. And here, we call it politics. She called it the fruit of cowardice. They were cowards to stand with Paul and say circumcision is invalid. Circumcision is not necessary. That's where they should have stood and what they should have said. They were cowards. I like to say they were a chicken. There are Christians today who play the political game, which is basically the people-pleasing game. You want to please everybody. Ellen White calls them cowards. But even though they were making the wrong decision, Paul knew it was wrong. Paul went along with it. What a testimony, friends. Paul went along with it and went through the process of purification, shaved his head. When you read the rest of the book of Acts, that, that actually got him in trouble and shipped to Rome, where he got executed. But Paul went along with it. Paul was a bigger man and went along with it. I sometimes find myself disappointed with church political decisions that happen. I do sometimes find myself disappointed with some church politics decision, political decisions that happen, whether it's conference-wide, union-wide, North American division-wide. I get sometimes disappointed, but I find myself most disappointed. Forget, forget our church leaders. I find myself most disappointed in myself with the political decisions I make. I sometimes find myself disappointed with church politics, but even more disappointed with the political choices I make in my life. When I play, when I, when I am, what's that word? When I have the fruit of cowardice. Is there anyone else out there also who wants to confess that you sometimes are a coward? That you sometimes play the, the, the political game, the people-pleasing game? Is there anyone else? Confession is good for the soul. And this isn't, you know, a game. Is there anyone else? Raise your hand. Praise the Lord. 
praise the Lord. For the rest who did not, pride will take you to the lake of fire, friends. Every one of us has played that role. Or have you always been a person of, 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 of principle and never bended? If you think you have, ask God and the Holy Spirit will, will remind you when you haven't. Just like in the early church, there was politics and yet the Spirit of God still moved in the church. The Spirit of God still moved in the church. See, the book of Acts presents a church that is very similar to our church. And praise the Lord, friends. This should give us hope. The early church dealing with prejudice, with discriminating. And I just covered a few. There are much more things in the book of Acts. There is a story there in the book of Acts chapter 6 where they were not distributing to the Hellenist Jews. There was an issue of division even among themselves there. The church dealing with hypocrisy, with personality conflicts, and yet the church is still growing and the spirit is still, wor excuse me, and the spirit is still working miracles. That should give us hope, friends. It gives me hope in my church. Not just my church here in Cleburne, but my church worldwide. Although I hear and see many problems that I see in the church and fights that I see in the, in the church, I am confident that the Spirit is still working in the church. Confident. Why? Because it worked in the early church. It worked in the early church. And what the church needs is ordinary people who are not perfect but put their faith and trust in a perfect God. And just as the Holy Spirit walked and moved in the early church, faulty as it was, God will do the same with our church, faulty as it is. God will continue to bless and pour out His Spirit in His church today. The question is, will you be part of it? Will you be part of it, friends? The church will continue. The church will continue to, go, to grow. The church will make it to the kingdom of heaven. There in your meditation from selected messages, Satan will work his miracles to deceive. He will set up his power as supreme. The church may appear as about to fall, but it does not. And it will not. You know why? Because this is the church of Jesus Christ. It is not the church of Harley Charles. It is not the church of the Texas Conference. It is the church of Jesus Christ. And God will be with his church and he will deal with the issues in the church. We see him dealing with the issues here at the beginning with Ananias and Sapphira and even with other conflicts as well. God will deal with the church. And I, I can testify that God, in certain times, has dealt with church leaders. He has. God, the finger of God, has touched to deal with certain issues. So I'm confident that God will continue to lead His church. But will you be part of that, friends? Will you be part of God's church? Even with the hypocrisy that you see in the church, even maybe with the disagreements, with the personality differences that we have, with the theological differences maybe that we have, will you still be part of the church? My prayer is that you will be part of that church. That you will be part of that church. Because God's church will go through. And God is just looking for people who keep their eyes focused on Jesus Christ. Regardless of the situations and problems that we have, we continue to work. We continue to work and marching forward. 
There is a song in Spanish, I don't, it does not exist in English, but it says that the church continues to march on. The church continues through the valleys, through the highs, through the lows. The church continues to go forward, continues to go forward. And so I just want to invite everyone here to be part of the church. You see something in church that isn't right, that shouldn't, that, that, that shouldn't be there. If it needs to be addressed, it can be addressed. Deal with it, with, talk with it over with the elders. But other than that, you continue working and being active and marching forward with the church. Do not let Satan shift you out or shake you out. Because God's church, as faulty as it is, just like the early church, was filled with the Holy Spirit. And he will continue to fill this church with his Holy Spirit. Amen. How many want to be part of that church? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we've just briefly seen little things in your early church that we can relate to today in our church. But Father in heaven, help us not to get discouraged and looking at those little things or maybe they're big things, but to continue putting our faith and trust in you because we know that you will iron out, you will take care of any issues or problems that rise among your church. It's your church and you are coming for her. Help us to be faithful and as you have said, he who endures to the end shall be saved. So Lord, we just ask for your Holy Spirit to endure to the end, keeping our eyes fixed on your Son, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.